often say when we do the work on violence against women, um, for us as women professionals or activists or whatever, it's really important that we remember our own experiences. Some of my very early experiences of being a woman and a girl child actually in relation to men was what I've experienced when I would walk to the shop and you know you would find adult men that would make sexualized comments and you know and, and even sometimes trying to reach out to touch and I was like horrified I couldn't believe and I remember actually how I would as a child I would like stand and I would say if you had prayed this morning, you would know not to speak to children like this. Or, you know, I kind of had this way of, of trying to defend myself as a child. I grew up with a father, and although he was not educated, we were very poor. I've never seen him violate or shame my mother or any one of my seven sisters. And so these examples of men who have grown up in a very patriarchal system, who have grown up in apartheid, who have grown up in very, very poor, difficult circumstances, but they've emerged, you know, fully human, in their truth, in their integrity, without shaming and violating and abusing women. Post apartheid the last 20 years, I think the South African government has done quite amazing actually because in 1994 with our, the dawn of the democracy, um, just for the government to identify violence against women as a national priority, I think that was a very, very important step. 20 years on, we are talking about all of those aspects, we're talking about men, men's place, their role, etc. We are talking about patriarchy. In our training with religious leaders, we, we show them how apartheid as an oppressive system and patriarchy as an oppressive system are Siamese twins. In terms of the civil society, that has been invited to, to give input or listen to the report that the South African government has put together um, on the Beijing Declaration and how we are doing. Um, some of, some of the, the concern for me related to how South Africa really has to caution itself that it, I mean, it's a young democracy. We have, you know, established legislation, we are learning, we are implementing some many, many aspects we haven't yet implemented. So my concern at times is that it, it feels like the South African government wants to come into these global conversations as if they have many, many years of, of um, experience in the global scene. At the expense, I think, at times, of, of articulating really what the South African women are saying today, what they are expressing, how they are expressing their own experiences. We have a responsibility, those of us who work in this field, we have a responsibility to expand our own understanding of the work that we are doing. Um, I'm very concerned that it at times feels that we are, we are placing more demand on the women that we seek to serve. Up until now, the, the options for abused women is she must leave, she must do everything that she can. She must either be silent, be more submissive, you know, go lay a charge, do, 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 a whole range of different things. Sometimes also give up her faith and a faith community if she wants to be safe. And so what I'm saying is, how is it possible that still today, 2015, with all the insights and everything that we've learned, how is it possible 
that we are still demanding of women to do more to be safe? Shouldn't we be holding whoever accountable, you know, men to do more f with their counterparts, but also um, when we talk about intervention and expanding intervention for perpetrators, it is about listening to what women are saying, what is the interventions that would make sense for them.